Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Each week, we bring you leading experts for a lively discussion on topics related to strategic nuclear deterrence. Our host is Dr. Adam Lowther, Director of Strategic Programs at the National Strategic Research Institute. The views of the hosts and the guests are their own. Welcome back to another episode of NucleCast. As every episode, with the exception of one, where Keith Butler sat in in my stead, I am the host, Adam Wilder, and today we have a guest, a special guest and friend, Colonel Retired Mike Gio, who is also the former, and this is where he and I got to be friends, the former editor of Strategic Studies Quarterly which is the the publication, the Air Force's strategic level publication. And the reason I asked Mike to come on the show is he is perhaps in the history of the written word, the greatest editor and shaper of articles that has ever existed in, in, in the history of time. He's exceptional at helping you develop arguments and develop well-crafted, well-reasoned, well-thought-out articles. And as as many of the listeners know, we had Dave Craig on uh, a while back to talk about publishing in Real Clear Defense. And and in, because the idea here with part of this is not just for you, the listeners, to listen to the wisdom and the exciting discussions we have, but to take your own experience and knowledge and turn that into your own thoughts and ideas that then get published because there's too few people in the nuclear enterprise that are out there explaining what we do and why we do it. And so in the spirit of helping everyone get even better at writing and publishing, Mike Eo, welcome to NucleCast. Thank you, Adam. You're very kind. As I always like to say, you're too kind. There you go again. (laughs) So, you know, really, honestly, I have yet to find somebody who does as good a job at helping me shape arguments and articles as you did in your time as the editor of SSQ. And, And I'd be willing to bet that there are many, many, many authors who would say the same thing. And so I, what I want to do is just have a conversation today and get sort of you from, from this editor's perspective on how can all of these folks who are out there and we talk about stuff and they read articles on, you know, on all, in all the publications, the defense publications and elsewhere, and they say, man, I've got an idea. You know, I really, this guy's full of, you know what, and, I, you know, I'm going to counter this. And then they get to the actual putting words on paper and then they say, oh, geez, I don't know. This is hard. I don't know. Nobody will pick it up. You know, I I don't know if I have the talent for this. And so if you think about writing, how do you go about planning to write? Well, and one of the things I've used over the years, and I've been doing this or teaching writing now since the... um, the early nineties <clears throat> is you, you start with an outline. And I like to say that good writing starts with an idea and it succeeds if the author is interested. But uh, that, ar- that outline beginning with an outline that uh, clearly lays out the plan of what you intend to write about is really uh, sort of the, the, the foundation of a, a successful piece in the end. And, in that outline, the author needs to focus on one main idea, sort of put that right up at the top of the of the outline, and then establish also up front a, a very good argument, an explicit argument or a position, so to speak. What you don't want to do is, I'm going to explore this or I'm going to discuss that. You know, that's that comes later, if at all. But you, you have to make an argument and have a position established right up front. And uh, you also need to do as part of that outline is 
put a sentence or two in there that says, here's what this article will not address. You know, you're not writing a book, particularly yeah. like in the pieces that, uh, you know, you guys work on a lot. These are short, more like op-eds, uh, maybe a little longer research pieces, but they're, they're not a book. So there's a lot of things you won't be able to get in there that you just put those aside and you take that out of the, out of the objections that somebody may critique your piece uh, when it comes out. And then uh, in that, that overview or that outline, you will obviously want to list your main points and then finally look at the implications and the, and the recommendations. It's a couple of things as you build this outline, you need to, to also think about it is what is the context of what you're writing? Um, a lot of times you get assigned a problem and as a student, let's say your instructor may say, I want you to write on this, but those those may or may not be an interest area for you. So you have to sort of choose the need. Um, a lot of times, in other times, a, a topic will emerge just from listening or reading. I, I get a lot of, used to get a lot of ideas from just reading two or three hours every morning. And, uh, and it gives you a sense of what is relevant now. And then finally, I'll say, one of the things that your organization does, Adam, is you, you look for rebuttal type articles. Uh, just, I've read several of yours in the last couple of weeks where you, someone makes a proposal or an argument and you write the rebuttal. Those to me are really the, the most interesting and they're also the easiest framework to, uh, to, to work they from. Are. <laughs> so yeah, if, you know, they're very, you know, especially if you're in, if you're in the business where there are protagonists and antagonists on, on both sides. So, <clears throat> begin with an outline that has an introduction. In other words, what's the context? Why is it important? What's the problem? How did the problem originate? What caused the problem? Why did this happen? Uh, what is your position? Remember, that's the, the real major issue is this is my position and this is why. And if I was uh, Machiavelli, I would say one other very important question, who is to blame, right? <laughs> no, we, <laughs> you don't really need that. It's, it's an inclination for most people. And then finally, on that overview, list the main points, uh, the framework. Is it pro or con? Is it cause effect? Is it action, reaction? And then your recommendations and implications. And we'll talk some more about all of those here in a minute. So what recommendations or implications, and you, you just sort of mention this, but what which one should they consider? Yeah, there's a, <clears throat> if I were able to show you some of the, the uh, slides that I use when I brief or when I, when I try to teach people how to write, it would, it's as far as recommendations and implications, there would be things like this. Can the problem be fixed or is it a problem that you simply have to manage, right? I, I learned this when I was in my, my state department job is there are some problems you just can't solve. You just have to manage them. You got to keep them from getting better, getting worse. So recommendations and implications, is it, can it be fixed? And if so, how do you do that? And then what should we do to fix it? How do we fix it? Who should fix it? When should we fix it? Where is the best place to fix it? What are the best resources to fix this problem? And then what remains to be done to complete the fixed, right? And if you, those are some of the, and, and then if you, so you've got your hook, you've established your problem, you've laid that out. Now you've gone through these series of questions. So for you, the listeners, you know, you may have to stop the podcast here, go back for a minute and then write down these set of questions that, that Mike just mentioned, because if you apply these, you'll be able to write anything from an 800 word op-ed to a 3,000 word policy piece to, you know, you could even write a book with each one of these questions as a chapter. So good outline, good hook in a question, good statement of the problem, and then this series of questions. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, that's exactly right, Adam. I, I think you hit it exactly right. These, these, uh, the things I'm talking about, whether you're writing an 800 word op-ed or, um, you, you know, a book. And by the way, I've, I've edited several books for friends of mine and for people who, like you thought, hey, maybe Mike can help me out here. Uh, I don't know which was worse is editing the book 
and sending that feedback or actually in several cases, taking a book size manuscript and making a 1500 to 2000 word article out of a, you know, a 150 page yeah. book. <laughs> There's a certain amount of skill there. And I, my hair used to be darker than it is today, but <laughs> at any rate, uh, the, the, the concepts and the issues we're talking about are the same, whether it's a, a, an op-ed or, or a book, they, they work. Yeah. And so if you're, you use, you mentioned article crafting and you, you talked a little bit about it, explain a little more. What is this concept of, you know, crafting and article crafting? Yeah. Th that's a, thank you for asking that question. It's one of my favorite. It's one of the, the things if I do anything well, it's crafting. And I, I almost, I, I, I sort of characterize myself as more of an, not so much an editor, which I, I, people have told me I'm pretty good at, but it's a crafter and there's a difference. If, you know, I used to work with some really talented editors and they were, they were just masters at grammar and usage. And that's fine. I don't even consider myself in the same league with some of the really good editors I've worked with over the 12 years that I was the editor. But there's a difference between those good editing skills and article crafting skills. And here's what I mean when I say, when I talk about argument crafting, what a crafter does is more like a, a, an artist or a, um, or an, a, a, a carpenter, sure. right? They, they take these ideas and they look at, initially as the the work as a whole and they try to balance the writing so in my case I, I did three reads and I'll talk to you about that I'd read the same piece three times and the balance I'm looking at is you only want the the in, introduction and the intro and sort of the setup to be maybe five percent of any piece and then the the middle of the piece should be the the guts of the piece and then the last so what recommendations implications should be about 20 to 25 percent so that's what i when i start crafting a piece i want to make sure that it kind of fits into that framework 5 75 20. and then i also want to think about the audience of where this piece is going are these not are you writing for a novice audience an audience that has no experience or are you writing for uh, you know, lawyers in the Pentagon, or, or senior leaders of government that maybe have a lot of experience. So that's a, a key in how you craft that article. And then when I read it, I stack the ideas. I want to make sure that the ideas are stacked in a logical flow. And as I read those ideas, I put them in the back of my mind because let's face it, you know, some of the, in some cases, these articles were 25 to sure. 30 pages long and you'd read them. You would read an idea up in the first third of the piece that really needed to be more in the, in the latter half or latter. And you've done that for me. You said, Hey, Adam, take this article, move it up, exactly. move it down. You know, you haven't framed it right. So I, I'm, I'm following. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that's kind of how I did it. And it's, it's, I think it's a difficult skill to teach. I don't know if I can teach a person how to do that, but if you if you get the idea then and, and you practice it, uh, you know, you just have to have have to have some some room in the in the in the hard drive to keep those ideas and stack them as you read and say, wait a minute, that idea is related to one that he he or she wrote on page three. And it needs to be they need to be together on page 17. And then the unity. So back back to the, the three reads. So the first read was. I read it as sections and stacking the ideas. Do the, do the sections line up logically? The second read, I read through each paragraph of a section. And those paragraphs have to have unity, you know. In other words, if we're talking about fruit, you know, I don't want to hear any, I don't want to hear any discussion about uh, zucchini yeah. in there, right? And the third read was down to the sentence level, right? And no kidding. When, when you get down to that, boy, you, you're talking about having a piece that really comes together. It's coherent 
and it makes the article. It's a synergistic sure. effect. When you do all three of those together, each piece complements the other and the bulk of the article is stronger than the individual pieces. And then the last thing I would say you do is after you do those reads, you need to let the piece incubate because that <laughs> you, you can't read my slide, but I, I, I think of it this way, that incubation period clears your mind's writing catch, right? <laughs> You, you you clear that and you leave it, come back to it the next day and you read it and you'll pick up one or two things every time. It's like, oh, yeah, this this word, this word needs to be changed or moved in a sentence. That's how I do it. That's what I mean by article crafting. So it's balance the writing first. Think about the audience, stack the ideas as you as you read it and then go back and shift those ideas to create unity in the paragraph and the sections and then let it incubate and uh, come back to it and give it one more good read. Well, it's that time of the show when we have to take a quick break. We're talking to Mike Dio, former editor of Strategic Studies Quarterly, and we'll be right back. This episode of NucleCast is brought to you by the Anwar Deterrent Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. And we're back, of course, I'm your host, Adam Lowther, and we're talking to Mikey O about writing because, as I've said earlier in the show and in our previous episodes, we need you folks, you experts in, who are out there across the nuclear enterprise writing and telling your fellow Americans, you know, what we do and what it's all about and why we do it. And, you know, for, for those that aren't in professions where writing is really part of it, you know, you've got experience that I would love to see you take and put on, you know, put it on paper, make it immortal, make that story or that experience immortal such that it's captured for posterity's sake and such that others who may be interested in your, I mean, we, we talk a lot about, uh, about recruitment and retention of keeper of personnel for the nuclear enterprise. And so maybe you write that article that spurs somebody to say, hey, that was really interesting. That guy or gal did something that I found that was fascinating. I want to do that job. How do I get into that? So you never know the effect that you may have with the written word. And so, you know, it's one of the things I've been, I think you and I have probably talked about this, Mike, and, and that is this question. Do you want to be Napoleon or Karl Marx? And it's something I've always thought about. You know, Napoleon was the doer. And he, you know, he did. And he shaped history from his doing. And then Karl Marx was the idea and writer. And I, I would submit to you that, you know, Marx has had a, you know, a more in, indelible impact on history than even one of the greats like Napoleon because his writings and his thoughts have lived on for 200 years. And so th the idea that words matter is just something I, you know, I'd, I'd encourage everybody to, you know, to take into account as they think about their non-writing jobs. They, they could really do something useful with written work. With that said, let's get back to your discussion of how to write. So how should authors evaluate their writing? They've, they've written their, they've had an idea, they put it on paper, they're not sure what to make of it. Now they've got to evaluate it. What do they do? Yeah, again, uh, in, in my case, I evaluate my own writing and those that I used to um, have as submissions. You, it, it 
goes back to a series of questions. As the author, you should be asking yourself, have I clearly stated a, an argument? Is there a, a limited thesis in there? At least something that people can, can gather right up front. Remember at the top 5% of the, of the piece, does, does my introduction um, tell the reader parts of my argument? Does the introduction gain the reader's interest? Does the conclusion complete and restate that argument? Does the conclusion avoid introducing new argument? <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> that's a perennial problem. And I'll talk about that when we, uh, when we talk later. Uh, does, does my conclusion uh, support the argument adequately? Have I supported the argument adequately, adequately by using um, evidence and using primary sources? <clears throat> Have I integrated those things well? Does the order of my ideas make sense? If you crafted it right, you can answer that question quite easily. Are the transitions smooth? And is the language plain, clear, and concise? Particularly if you're the kind of author who wants to uh, redefine well under, already well understood terms. So if you're going to use a, a non-standard definition of a term, then you need to make sure that's in there because yeah. people are going to ask those same kind of questions and they're going to evaluate you based on the, the original definition. Do any of the sentences not contribute to supporting my ideas? Uh, there, you know, there's a, there's a, a thing that uh, someone talked with Hemingway once and he said, uh, how do you know if your, if your article is, is ready to, be published and, and, or your book is ready to go. He said, if I can take out every kind of extraneous sentence and, and section and not change the meaning of the argument, I know it's ready. Right. And so I say, thank Hemingway and thank yeah. Hemingway. <laughs> um, and then finally, I'll say one other thing. You should ask three questions about the out about the implications of your writing. And these I, I learned again as one of my diplomatic things is, is the solution feasible? In other words, do we have the, the talent, the resources and the technology to do what you are arguing? Is it desirable? Does it need, does it need to be fixed? Who says it needs to be fixed? Does it need to be solved or just managed? Something I mentioned earlier. And then finally, is, is my solution acceptable? Is it legal? Is it ethical? Is it equitable? So those three things, is it feasible, is it desirable, and is it acceptable? If you can answer those in the positive, your article is on, a, is on its way to being a pretty good uh, pretty good. Yeah, piece. and you make a good point. One of the things I often find is I, you know, because I do quite a bit of editing of others' work, and I often find, and this is something I would encourage people to, to sort of think through, is they want to be fancy with their language. And they, they'll oftentimes use words incorrectly. They'll, because it's sort of a big word, they'll put it in a sentence where it's, it doesn't have the right meaning. So I would encourage people, keep it simple. Just keep it simple. Keep it straightforward. You don't need five, six, seven line sentences. You know, make your sentences brief and to the point. And then I, one of the, the, sort of a, along the lines of what you were saying, Mike, whenever, after I've sat it down and I go back to look at it, I, I look at every sentence and I say, can I simplify and shorten this sentence? Can I make it, can I cut, cut out uh, words or can I take three or four words and replace them with one word? And it, cause I'm trying to be as concise and clear. I think it was like Harry Truman. I think it was, he, he was asked to do a speech and he says, well, well, you know, if I, if I can, if there's no time limit, I'm ready now. You know, if, if I've got a half hour, give me a week. If I've got five minutes, I need a month. Because being precise and very clear and to the point is, is quite challenging. We tend to be sort of wordy and, and take people on rabbit trails. So I think a lot of what you're saying gets us to the point where we've got this very clear and that's sort of where you've helped me in the past is cut out all the extraneous stuff, cut out all the stuff that takes the eye off the ball and focus on that core argument. Yeah, I totally agree. I used to make a, 
a bit with uh, some authors, I'd say, I'll tell you what, I want you, I'm going to take your article and I will be happy to edit it for you, but you have to give me a dollar for every word I take out of your article without changing the meaning. <laughs> I think I'm, last time I checked, I bought a new vehicle with all that money. So can you share some ideas for writing quick and short arguments? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, so I would first say, why is this important? So tomorrow, some of you listening to this are going to read something in, in the Washington Post or the New York Times. You say, God, I disagree with that. I'm going to write those, those guys a letter right now. This is where you need to listen, right? This is how you do that. There are two ways. And I call these, these together, I call them shotgun writing, right? You just put it out there in a, in a blast. The first one is what I call the quick draw method. And it uh, doesn't matter how I learned this, but at any rate, uh, you, you, you do use some mind mapping to make a quick outline. So very quick, here's my three main points kind of thing. And you, you brain dump on those points almost immediately, right? And you, you, you do some quick writing. Maybe you write for 15 to 25 minutes, and then you take a five minute break, 25 to five to you know, 15 to 25 minutes and then another five minute break. And then that's what, what I would say. That's the down draft. Okay. You don't do any editing. You just brain dump, you know, while, while you, your, your blood is up and you know, you, you know, you're, you're worrying about this thing and you, somebody made you angry and you're going to write this down. And then you come back and you do this slow edit. So one is fast and then you get this slow edit. That's the down draft, right? That's the, the second draft is the up draft. That's where you take those things and you refine them. And you can do this very quickly. Um, one, I had a course once where we, we practiced this all the time, particularly mind mapping and writing it out. And it was just fabulous. You could really produce some good stuff. So that's one way, the, what I call the quick draw method. Quick outline, quick brain dump, quick writing. Take five minute breaks, go back to writing on the second main point and then edit it and you can edit it pretty quickly and then submit it. The second one is I don't take credit for this. This comes from a Professor David K. Johnson and it's called Crito, C-R-I-T-O. Uh, again, something I learned years ago and it and it's it basically the Crito stands for this. So what is the claim? What are the reasons for the claim? So the reasons what information supports or detracts from this claim? How do I test this claim? Or is there a procedure to test the claim and the, uh, the information in the claim? And then what are the objections? That, that's the one I like the most because, you know, Adam, as, as I have mentioned to you before in some of those things, people, if you, if you ab address the objections of your argument right up front, you, you take that argument out of your detractors, right? You just say, hey, these are so and it's, it's sort of you're in eliminating your own biases when you do that. So the crito is the second part of shotgun writing really quick. Here's the claim. Here's the reasons for the claim. Here's the information that I've been able to gather pro and con on supporting this in, this claim. And here's how I can test that information. And then, yeah. oh, by the way, here are people who don't agree with this claim, the objections. There you have it. Two ways to do really quick, very effective, uh, quick responses to things that uh, now, need for, to be Now, for many to. listeners, they will, you know, they'll write white papers in their daily jobs. They will, you know, they'll write policy statements. They'll, they'll write internal documents for their you know, their agency, their organization, their company, but for writing for publication, is there anything else we need to know about writing for publication? Yeah. Okay. Great question. And I thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I'll say this and I'll reiterate it at the end. Authors and publishers have the same interests, right? The publisher wants to have profound ideas before an influential audience. And the author wants those same ideas to their credit before an influential author, author before an influential audience. So remember that. And it's, it's important to both the author and the publisher. Never let your position drive out your interest. 
Right? Never let your position drive out your interest. In other words, well, I've got to have this per paragraph in there. It's essential. And if the publisher says, no, it's not really essential, your interest is getting your, your good ideas, the remainder of your good ideas be before that audience. So never let your position drive out your, in your interest. You also need to match your ideas yeah. to the scope of the publisher. Okay. Uh, that's something, you know, you'd obviously you would write for the particular publication. Yeah. Based on, and uh, I'll, on the this topic. is a point I right. want to hammer home. Um, so people will say, I want to write an article. Well, go to the website of the publisher. They'll usually have submission guidelines. If you keyword search submission guidelines, it'll be there and they'll tell you, we want 800 or a thousand words. We want, you know, this style. We, we won't take articles that do these things. Hmm. So go ahead, Mike. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the other thing I'll tell you is focus on quality. Uh, remember this, when, when there's a choice between quality and quantity, always go for quality. You'll do yourself a favor in the long run. Stephen Walt, uh, you know, most of you know who Stephen Walt is. He wrote a great piece in foreign policy in February, 2016, about uh, how to do this well and, and how this kind of quality writing will actually help you for tenure. I will tell you this, there are few, few squall scholars yeah. who can do both. There are far too many scholars who <laughs> cannot do either. So know the difference, you know, you, you always focus on quality. Uh, someone told me this when I was a brand new editor, I was in the editor business, maybe my first year. And they said, if you don't focus on quality, your journal will, will perish. And here it is. It's, you know, uh, gosh, we had uh, 15 years or 20 years of, of publishing. Um, new ideas are the best ideas. I, I never was enthralled with the ideas that had already been covered. And one time I asked Colin Powell, I said, hey, can you write an article about uh, the expansion about NATO and, you know, the future of NATO? And he basically said the libraries of the world are full of tomes about NATO. I don't want to do that. And he was right. So the new ideas are the best ideas. And those ideas, because those ideas have the greatest impact, they have the relevance to scholarly publishing. OK, policy first. Uh, it's yeah, it, it's you really need to focus on policy issues, because those are the ones that have a so what, okay? Those are the ones that are going to get people to, uh, in, of influence to make changes in our world. And then uh, challenge the conventional thinking. That's what I'm asking you to do as a publisher. Uh, let's see, what else? I'll tell you some, some common mistakes. Um, more than one main idea or a subject, you know, you're trying to cover everything and there's no clear art argument or thesis within the piece. Uh, too much information, particularly you throw it, it's the oh, by the way ending, right? So I'm an author and I have all of these ideas, but I don't have time to write five different articles. So I'm going to put everything I've ever read, everything I've heard, everything I've learned, everything I believe in one plea, in one article. It's a bloody mess, okay? So the result is totally unfocused. It's unreadable, uh, it's, it's wordy, and it's redundant. And remember, I, I, I mentioned already, think Hemingway and think Hemingway. Take stuff out that is superfluous. No overview, no, no uh, and too much, too much text, right? You're either over or you're undersided. There's a pretty good balance there. Uh, it's easier. It was very easy for me to see the ones that were just totally oversighted. Yeah. There was no original thought. It was everybody else's borrowed ideas. No recommendations, no closing, and no so what. If you take my argument and you accept it, here's what will happen. If you don't, you gotta have a here's so what's what. going to happen. Or here's what I think. Yeah, exactly. And then the oh, by the way, <laughs> oh, I forgot to mention this, you know, and oh, Don't by the way, it. you know, and then you go on off it. Yeah, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, get the hook, you know, yeah. As a, I, when I when I read that, I release the safety. That's one on of those revolver. night at the Apollo, if yeah. you remember the old show where the hook would come out. <laughs> hey, I'm not that old. Uh, and then. Uh, more common mistakes, co-authorship. Co There's too much repeated information. And boy, this, it, it didn't take much skill to see when a piece was co-authored yeah. and who wrote each piece. 
too many repeated citations, conflicting styles and tone. Now I'll tell you a couple of things as a publisher over the years here, there are a couple of things that are real fouls that you as an author, you do not want to go here. Okay. And that is not acknowledging your previously published material, yeah. yours or someone else's, right? We know what plagiarism is, but even self plagiarism is an issue. And I'll tell you what, in, in 12 years as an editor, I, I only had one instance where an author, when I questioned the author about, hey, you're, you're basically, you're tra taking one of your old articles and retreading it, uh, it was 70% the same. And it's like, no, I'm sorry, I, that's just not, oh, this author was just incensed that I didn't understand what I was doing and that people do this all the time and I've updated it. Well, it was 70% the same, okay? So if you're gonna do that, you need to tell the, tell the publisher and you need to certainly acknowledge it. This was sent to me with no acknowledgement that it had been 70% of it had been published somewhere else, which is a real big foul. You know, we as, a, we, we as an ethical publisher said, we want to acknowledge that this material has actually ended up somewhere else already. And then covert submissions to one or more publishers. Again, be upfront with the publisher. It's exclusive to you. I haven't sent it anywhere else. Or, hey, it's being evaluated three places. Okay, that's fine. You know what that tells me? I've, been, I've got to hurry up and get through this piece and tell the author, I'll take it. Okay. And that leads me to the next one. Once I tell you it's accepted, then I got it. Okay. I don't want to hear you do some late withdrawals and withdrawal after it's accepted. And then plagiarism, I mentioned. Um, and then, you know, get a, get a peer review on your, on your things. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, uh, yeah, that's I mean, that's one of the great things is, you know, always have somebody who isn't you and who doesn't have your expertise in the subject read your paper as a layman. And that helps you to understand, are your arguments clear? Are they concise? Are they? And, you know, fortunately mm -hmm. for me, it's I, I think I, you know, I ended up inadvertently marrying well because I married I married an editor. So my wife is an editor who who edits everything I ever publish. So that's incredibly helpful. But for you know other folks, your your spouse, your wife, your husband, whomever can can still read your stuff and say, man, I just don't know. I don't know what your argument is. It's not clear. It's not. And if you're going to write for you know popular publications, writing you know at that sort of eighth grade level is really what you want to do if you want to be able to convey an argument well. Now, go ahead, Mike. Well, uh, uh, I have only one uh, closing comment. And one, of, uh, first of all, uh, yeah, your truer words were never spoken. You married very well. You, you really married up. I can attest to that. And now I, I, I understand how you had this modicum of success. Uh, here's my closing thoughts. As I already mentioned, one more time, authors and editors have the same interest. They want to offer profound ideas to an influential audience. So never let your position drive out that interest. And then finally, I'll leave you with the thought that any journal or any book that a publisher wants is only as good as the profound ideas within it. Some of those ideas, some of those profound ideas or ideas like yours. Yeah, so yeah. You and to all the, the listeners out there, thanks, Mike. Thanks for coming on the show. And to all the listeners, who better to have a profound idea than, than one of you folks out there doing real things that people don't necessarily know or talk about? So take away this discussion with Mike and think, hmm, can I put something on paper? Can I inform the public? What kind of a profound idea might I have? Thanks for coming on the show, Mike. And thanks to I you, the you listeners. And you. we'll see you next time on Nuclecast. Well, that was a good talk on the part of Mike Dio. You know, our interview was in part. Uh, taken from, uh, I used to have him come out and speak to my students when I was the director of SANS to help them understand how they can write better. And so I really enjoyed his 
advice because it was advice I've taken advantage of and I hope it's some advice that you'll take advantage of because the whole point of you know having Mike on was to encourage you to write and for those of you that are not in in jobs where you would normally write and publish to spur you and encourage you to go out and do just that. This has been a production of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Grunthal. Follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at Nuclecast. Listen, follow, and review the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast.